Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Ben Stewart, who just finished part two of his series on death. Ben, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, man. Yeah. We, man, we've got a, a ton of questions to get through, so <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm just going to dive wow. right in. Okay. So, uh, first question uh, is about Lazarus. You, re you referenced Lazarus yep. in your sermon and you referenced how he ha was in a state of consciousness mm -hmm. after death. He was aware of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so this question, wa this person wants to know, where was he exactly? Was he in a ghostly state? Um, and uh, was he able to see and hear everything that's going on? Which leads into a second question. Can our loved ones who are in heaven yeah. now see what's going on in earth? Yeah, well, I would say uh, there's two Lazaruses mentioned in the Bible. There's the one Jesus raised from the dead. Sure. We mentioned that his story last week. Right. And then um, this Lazarus I mentioned is in Luke 16. It's a, <clears throat> a parable Jesus tells about a poor man named Lazarus who dies at the doorstep of a rich man, and then the rich man also dies. And in, as Jesus unpacks the story, Lazarus goes to a place uh, in the afterlife where he sees Abraham from the Old Testament and right. converses with him. And so he's aware, comfortable. He doesn't really describe that space, but so I, he's not a ghost, you know, running around in his old house. Right. You know, he's right. up with these people. And then the rich man is in, Hades is what Jesus says. He's in a place of torment. Right. Uh, instantly, they're both there and a great chasm separates the two, Jesus says. So they're both in these states, one in comfort, one in great discomfort. Right. And that's the basis of Jesus' story is this guy wants a chance to, to leave, go warn other people. Right. And Jesus' whole story is you die once and then there's judgment. Now, it's part of a story, so can you take every part of it and say that's exactly how it'll play out? It's hard to know if Jesus was just trying to make the point you only die once, or if each part of that is, this is exactly how it plays out. Sure. I think it's probably um, wise or, or, or fair to say, he, he's probably presenting things accurately as they are, that um, there is a place they go. And as you look at Paul, you go, that place is not just with Abraham, it's with God. I mean. Right. It's in the presence of God. That's where Lazarus is. So he's not floating around the earth. Um, it's different than being in a fully physical form, but what does that look like or mean? The Bible doesn't fully unpack that. Right. Um, can they see what's transpiring on earth? It's not clear in that passage. Sure. Um, they're aware of history as it rolls on right. because the, the rich man is asking about, can I go see my brothers? Can I do whatever? Right. And God tells him no. Um, but, um, so is there a level of awareness? You can't say that definitively. Sure. I guess so. I would kind yeah. of maybe lean towards, I guess so, based on revelation. There's even in heaven, there's a consciousness of what's happening in other places, right. but I don't know if I can be definitive on that. Sure. And I think with the subject of death, we're going to have to get comfortable with there being a certain amount of mystery. Yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. can't, we can't know everything. There's aspects God really wants to hammer. And the right. biggest one is what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because right. at the end of the day, it's all about him. And even in this passage, it's those who die in Christ will rise with Christ. Mm -hmm. And our great hope is seeing Christ. I mean, so all of it is about Christ. And so it, these are good questions, but it's, it's important to not lose sight of, of the main thing. Absolutely. And so uh, another person wrote in and they wrote about the Hebrew concept of Sheol, the grave. Yeah. And they wanted to know how does a Christian, um, someone who's in Christ, uh, deal with this ancient Hebrew concept of Sheol? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, revelation, uh, like revealing understanding of how the universe works rolled out over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't think there, there was mystery in the Old Testament of what exactly is happening after death. Mm -hmm. And so a belief in something positive happening begins to, you, you begin to see it in David. I don't think I'm going to be abandoned to right. decay, you know, right. when his son dies. I think I'm going to go be where he is. And, and then you even see in Jesus' day when he's alive, they're even talking about the resurrection at the last day. And yeah. so this was in Hebrew thought, but there was ambiguity for them about yeah. what happens beyond the grave. Yeah. And so um, it's not inconsistent with the New Testament but um, it's dimly lit in the old. Right. 
and the wattage turns up in the new that we, we see and know more about it right. uh, would be a, a really short answer to that question. No, that's good. They just, that just wasn't something that they were concerned it's as much question. with. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so another person wanted to, uh, they had a question about cremation. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, your father was cremated and right. um, cremation's been on the rise. Yep. Uh, and they want to know, is it biblically acceptable to be cremated? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, John Piper did a longer like article and video on this that I thought was good. Um, the short view, which, which is the same as my own, is if you're getting cremated because of the cost, that's, that's sort of a bummer. I mean, historically, uh, Christians have been buried because of the imagery in the Bible of, of being going to sleep right. and then your body rising and, and resurrected. Uh, and so that's where historically Christians have wanted to do that. Sure. Um, and, uh, but is it wrong to be cremated? There's nothing that says that it's, it, cremation is not a historically Christian idea, right. but it's not like, and then you'll be in trouble if you do it. Like it's, it's okay. It's not ultimately determinative of what happens when you die, sure. but it's determinative of what have you done with Jesus. So, right. um, you know, so my dad wanted to be cremated. So I, I said, I want to respect that. That's why sure. we did that. But it wasn't. Um, you know, I, I probably would have, if it was left at a zero, I probably would have buried him, but, sure. but I don't think you've sinned either way. No, and I think people worry sometimes w with the idea of resurrection of the body, yeah. um, with creation that we, we might mess that up in some kind of yeah. way, but, uh, a guy can redeem and restore yeah. anything and everything. And so I don't, I don't think that should be a stumbling block. And he will. I mean, people decay, compose right. their bodies. So this recomposition, whatever's going to happen at the end is a pretty radical moment. Right. And, uh, and God's okay with a lot of mystery around it. Yeah, absolutely. And so here's another question that I think a lot of people, whether they admit it out loud, they, they wonder about this. Um, mm -hmm. What does the Bible say about our animals um, yeah. <laughs> going to heaven? <laughs> Dogs, yes. Cats, no. Uh -oh. Next question. My wife. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean... In the eternal state and revelation, we have a meal right. and we eat food sure. and there's animals involved in that too. So is there an animal presence? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so does that mean your dog will be there with you? I don't know. I mean, historically people would say no because animals don't have souls, but that's because they were trying to say the uniqueness of human is our presence of souls, but that. I don't think that's necessary to understand what image of God means. Yeah. So does your dog have an immaterial being? Sure. The Bible's not particularly concerned with that. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, so they eat fish and it's not like, don't do it. You know, like uh, <laughs> Jesus had fish and was fine. So right. um, the, the short answer is, I would guess so. Sure. But I don't know for sure. Because right. that's not the Bible's main concern. Right. Again, another mystery that yeah. we just have to be okay yeah. with not Sorry. knowing. That's yeah. the theme. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, and so um, the subject of the rapture and of second coming, tribulation, all that fun stuff. The, we had quite a few questions Let's come in. Yeah, you just want to go through it? Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think we have time for that. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, I would like for you to address maybe some helpful resources that you could point people to that yeah. could help them understand this topic a little more. Yeah. So, I mean, the passage we read, First Thessalonians, is where you get the word rapture. Right. It means caught up in the air with him. And so, and then Jesus, you know, in his discourses towards the end of his life, talked about a time of great tribulation. And so people wonder, does the Christian rapture, do we exit? And then there's a season of great tribulation. And then God comes and restores the earth. Or do we have a great season of tribulation? Then we rise and meet him and come down immediately. Or is there some other, ver there's a couple other versions. Right. Um, and people debate it. And, and it's, uh, it is maybe broader than the scope we want to get into here. Th there's some great books and I don't have the name of them right now, but they're typically called like four views, mm -hmm. three views, things like that. So there's like four views on the millennium. Okay and uh, I believe three views on the rapture. And the reason why I'd recommend those books is because the way the editors did it is they got a, a solid bona fide scholar that truly believes each view right. to speak his view. 
and then each other writer gets to speak their view. Right. And then they each get a few pages to comment on the other person's view. And so these are great books to read, Four sure. Views on the Rapture, Three Views on the Millennial, those sorts of things, because you'll get to see people presenting the view they actually believe right. and all of them interacting with everyone else's idea. And then you can make up your mind which one you think is the most faithful to the text. That's what was helpful to me. So I could recommend you books that present what I believe. Um, but I think if um, you read these, you'll get a sense of everybody and then hopefully arrive where I have. So. Right. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my view. Sure. Yeah. 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 But it's helpful. Yeah. They get a bunch of different perspectives. So you're not just being indoctrinated with one view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. That's helpful. And so another question that came up, um, they talked about how uh, in the in scripture it says um, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. We never know when. Um, and in the Bible, it seems like they were ready for him then. Like they thought it could be tomorrow. They could be yes. right then. Right. Uh, like the end times that they were talking about was right then. Yep. But it's been 2000 years and right. still nothing. Mm. Um, and so his question was, how do we, uh, will people be saying the same things that we're saying now in another 2000 years? Like, well, um, basically he says, the more time that pass, will it be harder to stand firm uh, that he is indeed coming or will we start to lose hope? Yeah, some people may lose it. I mean, the Bible even talks about that. Some sure. people's love will grow cold. Some people will say, well, each day rolls on like the next. Right. But the Bible's not all that concerned about that, too. I mean, Jesus, when he talked about days will get difficult, I mean, he's talking about earthquakes, wars, all this stuff you typically hear about in the end times. And he right. goes, this is just the beginning of birth pangs. Yeah. So he's like, all that stuff you see is signed to the end. He goes, oh, that's like barely the beginning of the end. Right. And you go, what does that mean? And at the end of the day, what it means is things, things are going to get worse before they get better. Mm -hmm. But the timing, Jesus was real clear. I'm not going to tell you, right. and you don't know. And so anyone who says he knows doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. And so there was a sense of expectation, but there wasn't disappointment. Like when Paul realized, you know, when he wrote the Thessalonians, he was like, we who are alive will be caught up. He kind of thought he'd be in that. Sure. But towards the end of his life, he says, I'm about to depart and be with Christ, and that's better. Sure. So he wasn't real shaken by that. Right. In 2 Peter 3, you know, Peter mentions that he'll come like a thief in the night passage. But if you look just a few verses above, that's where Peter says he's not slow, as some count slowness. Right. A day for the Lord is like a thousand years. But he is patient with us, yeah. wanting everyone to come to repentance. Sure. And so... Peter's argument was when people say, oh, he's slow because none of this is really real or God's not really going to do it. Peter was like, no, he's being patient because if you don't know Christ, you want the clock to keep running right. um, because that gives you more of a chance. That's right. And so his patience is based on his grace, right. not slowness, not anything else. It's kindness. Right. And so when we see a slowness, we're supposed to see opportunity. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me of the, the Israelites when waiting for the Messiah. They went hundreds and hundreds of years without hearing a word. Yeah. No prophets, no nothing. Uh, yeah. Radio silence from God. And then Jesus showed up and you know, changed yeah. the course of human history. I mean, Noah's dad thought he had the guy. And you're like, dude, you're not even, right. we're not that deep into this book, bro. Right. Like, yeah. so, you know, so yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Again, we have history. precedent. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. Uh, so final question. Um, in your sermon, you mentioned how uh, an argument that um, you said skeptics cannot explain the community of believers that we have now as a result of the resurrection right. of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, this person says, what about a, a person that could counter that argument and say that there's communities of believers that exist in other religions yeah. as well? Like Christianity isn't necessarily unique in that. Yeah, and maybe I didn't explain it very clearly because I felt like I was going fast through that. But my point in that was what is unique about Christianity is our basis, our foundation is not uh, the teachings right. of our leader. Right. You know, uh, sure. it's not, it's not a, a pathway uh, to get to heaven. It's not mm -hmm. a set of, of pillars that we must uphold. Our basis was from last week a historical event, right. the death of Jesus and the physical resurrection of Jesus. So, right. you know, we can debate the veracity of a, a list of teachings, but a historical event either happened or it didn't, right. you know? So that's where you're like, for a community of people 
in those same days to say, no, that event happened and I'm willing to die for that. That's different than saying, I really believe these teachings. Right. You know, so that's where the Christian is unique is we're not saying we really believe the teachings of Jesus. We think they're really upbeat and helpful. We go, no, we really believe he died and beat death. And, and so our hope of dying and beating death is built on that historical fact, right. not just the words of Jesus. And right. that's where we're unique and different. So right. that's how I'd respond to that. of going, yeah, there's a lot of belief systems that have large communities that believe them. Right. Where we're different is that community started instantly it grew rapidly and it was built on an event that was provable or disprovable in that moment, that this guy's no longer in that grave. Right. And uh, that's why we're unique. Right, that's why you reference Paul. Uh, he wrote his letter within the lifetime of so many eyewitnesses who knew yeah. Jesus, talked to him, lived life with him. And it would have been so easy if you had written those letters as a scam or a lie for people to be like, no, 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 that's not true. That's yeah. completely false. I mean, he said it last week in the passage last week. Uh, he said, go, to, go talk to him. Right. You know, exactly. he's like many of whom are still alive. He's right. saying like, you can go talk to these guys. Absolutely. You know, uh, Paul said it when he was on trial. He said, this has not been done in a corner. Right. Yeah, <laughs> he said, exactly. this, is, this happened in front of all you guys. Right. And uh, so it's, it's an event and that's different. Absolutely. Well, Ben, thank you so much sure, man. for thank being you. here with us. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.